it's you. Hi, you're the problem, it's you. Jewish people, I think he's been wronged, and yes. I think that he's aiming sometimes a howitzer, he's being imprecise. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, but he's not wrong about everything. Look, is there a conversation to be had about secular hum humanists with Jewish last names in Hollywood exploiting people uh, in positions of, uh, you know, the performance arts talent? Yeah. This is a perfect example of how the right shifts the Overton window, because first someone like Kanye comes out and says, you know, I love Hitler, and Jews control the media. And then someone like Crowder comes along and says, well, let's add a little bit of nuance to this. The media has been very unfair to Kanye West, and I really do think there's a conversation to be had about Jewish people in the entertainment industry. And suddenly there's a conversation to be had about Jewish people. There's a conversation to be had about transgender people. And suddenly it's like, oh, where do you stand on the Jewish question? And now anti-Semitism just fully enters the discourse. It's crazy. Today I want to talk to you guys about movies that depict slavery. And I want to start off by asking you which ones have you seen, how many have you seen, and overall what was your experience when watching them? Personally, I have a pretty hard time watching these type of movies. The last one I watched I want to say was Mudbound on Netflix. And y'all know I got a white woman lover and we was watching it and I was like, girl you have to go into the other room. I'm gonna need five minutes. I'm gonna need five minutes. But seriously, you all, I find these movies to be so incredibly important. I remember the first time I watched Roots as a child, it was like a requirement. My mom was like, bitch, you watching this. And it was so emotional and all consuming for me to watch. And I remember as a child thinking, if white people have access to these type of stories, to these type of movies, how are we still going through this shit? How can they watch and not empathize with the black struggle? I'm bringing this up because Will Smith's new movie, Emancipation, comes out December 9th, and I've seen a lot of discussion and a lot of comments amongst white people talking about how they refuse to watch the movie after his debacle at the Oscars. I'm not here to debate your personal feelings about Will Smith and his transgressions, but I do want to state, in my personal opinion, I don't believe that his actions excuse you from watching this movie and learning about this story. It's one thing to read about it, to be told about it, but there's this thing about cinema and it kind of brings all of those things together and really provides such a immersive experience. And I believe as a white ally, it's almost your duty to consume this kind of information. With that being said, I hope you all take the time to check out Emancipation and other movies like it and really absorb. It's rough. It's definitely rough, but I think it's necessary. Norman needs his nails cut so bad, and he keeps walking around, fucking tippy-tippy tapping, and I just need him to relax. Okay, go ahead and take a seat. <laughs> Sometimes you do listen to me. Hello, and welcome back to Spite and History, also known as things the bad mustache man hated that I as a Jewish woman continue to do out of spite. And today we are continuing on with companies that you might not have known were collaborators with the Not So Nice Party. Except today, a lot of people actually do know about this one because today we're talking about Volkswagen. Now there are two people responsible for the creation of what became the VW Beetle, Ferdinand Porsche and the bad mustache man himself. Prior to the 1930s, most German cars were luxury, so only about 2% of the population could actually afford to own a German-made car. The idea of the people's car, or Volkswagen, became very popular in this populist rise to power. Now in 1933, luxury car company owner Ferdinand Porsche built his proof of concept, the Volks Auto. The bad mustache man loved this idea, and he wanted to mass produce them 
for the German populace to buy. Unfortunately, the Volks Auto was a little bit too expensive and couldn't come in at the price point that Bad Mustache Man was hoping for. So what he did was he opened a state-owned factory to produce the Volkswagen, and it cost a family about $400 in U.S. money in the 1930s. They could also go on a payment plan to pay for this car. By 1946, Volkswagen was producing about a thousand cars per month. And after the war, when the company was offered up to American, British, and French car companies, every single one of them said no. What's most interesting is that it was offered at no cost to the American car company, Ford, and they turned it down as well. Now, Ford is curious as to why they turned it down, because Bad Mustache Man was a huge fan of the founder of the company, virulent anti-Semite and racist Henry Ford. We're going to talk about him another day. Now, do I own a Volkswagen? Uh, no. It's, it's very cute, the VW Beetle, but I just, I can't. This is the nonfiction book tag. These are my favorite categories of nonfiction. This is a go-to recommendation. This is one I think everyone should read. This is one that is perfect for my specific niche interest. This is an amazing story. And this is an all-time favorite. Baby, listen. Do not let a man ruin your life. Ruin his life first. It's PEMDAS. I bully myself for being disabled. Welcome to week two of not taking care of myself. Uh, I've let my neck beard grow in, so now I've got the perfect double chin. <laughs> I've been struggling a lot with being disabled this week because my brain isn't doing what I want it to do, which is not be disabled. I haven't been able to be productive or able to really leave the house or do any of the things that would make capitalism happy. I've just been able to feed myself and keep myself alive, which are in fact wins, but I have not been seeing them that way. I'm not even particularly sure what's going on this time because I've got so many things wrong with my brain that it could be any number of them all at once. You see, I was born with both ADHD and autism because God loves to hug me extra tight. I was born into an abusive home and then when I was 18 years old, I joined the military and I took that autistic brain to war and it turns out that's really bad for it. And then I came home and I worked on an ambulance for too long until my partner was killed by a drunk driver, which is also, fun fact, really bad for your brain. And because I was raised in an abusive environment, uh, most of the relationships I sought out as an adult were also of the same caliber of abuse because that's what feels like home to me. Anyway, we've been stirring that up in therapy recently, and now my brain refuses to participate in being a person anymore. Is it depression? Is it autistic burnout? Is it simply the absurd journey of healing from all that? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe it's all of them. Maybe it's just the war again. That one just crops up from time to time. I feel every emotion, although anger is predominant amongst them. Uh, I can't sleep, but I'm sleeping 13 hours a day. Figure that one out. Uh, I don't enjoy any of the things that I used to enjoy, or I enjoy them so much that I refuse to do anything but them. For a few hours, I could do nothing but stare at the wall, and then I watched all of the Star Wars show Andor. There was a chunk of time where I couldn't even move. I, my brain refused to send the signals to my body to make it move. Uh, and then randomly, it decided to play a video game for 10 straight hours. I don't know what it wants. But here's the thing. That's fine. That's normal for me. That's like the expected response for what I have done to my brain. The government agrees that what it did to send me to this place is its fault, and we're all together in agreement that I am indeed disabled. But I have ascribed a moral value to it, and that moral value is that I am a failure. Because I'm not a productive little cog in the capitalism system, and the capitalism system wants me to be a productive cog. And even though nobody is outright telling me that that's what I need to be, the pressure of that system is making me feel horrific about being disabled. No funny bow at the end. We're working on it in therapy. But I thought it was important for you to see mental health creators struggle. Yay, healing. Do people ever realize how unwilling white people are to move out of other people's way? 
and I feel like this isn't just white people, but it's it's people who are who are trying to uphold their own power in in a way that upholds their power over other people. So if you have a certain amount of power because you have a certain privilege, you are trying to uphold that privilege over another person by minimizing their physical space and maximizing your physical space. Jesus, hold on. So for example, when white people get on the elevator, I typically don't see them move out of the way, scoop back. Um, when they do get on, it's almost like they take up uh, enough space to make them comfortable, even if everybody else is kind of trying to like maneuver themselves in a way that's making um, making sure everybody is somewhat comfortable and can fit. Again, I'm not even saying just white people do this, but <laughs> I see it so much from white people. Or like you're walking up and down the street. I have almost always had white people expect me to move out of the way for them even if they're walking on the side of the street that I would typically walk on if I was going like north like and I don't want to say the wrong side of the street because like the side of the street that people walk on is different in different countries and different spaces but they will be like derailing the flow of traffic like completely derailing the flow of traffic and then still expecting other people to move out of their way I see this especially to like black queer and trans folks, black women, like, and I just wanted to lay that out there, that like racism and racism as it's tied to other forms of harm, other other methods of harm, like ableism, queer phobia, transphobia, it's like a physical thing that occurs where people prove to you day in and day out how they physically have no respect for your body and do not value um your personal space and not only that but they value their own personal space so much they have such superiority um complexes in their minds that they can't even fathom that you should not accommodate them i'm gonna be 100,000 percent the shooting in colorado springs absolutely terrifies me but what terrifies me even more than that is the lack of reaction by like conservatives like data has come out that the whole trans people are like weird and coming for your kids talking point is the least effective among republicans however the people who it works on go absolutely crazy and everyone else just seems to be kind of apathetic which is terrifying like unironically this is how fascism operates it's how it builds when you have people just kind of willing to let minorities get targeted. I don't even have any kind of like nuanced or intelligent political commentary to make. It's literally just horrifying. People of color, what is one microaggression that you've received that has just been so weird and off the wall? As a Latina, I can safely say that most, many actually, white white like americans believe that every country in south america is actually just mexico it is truly saddening to say that there have been numerous instances where these white americans ask me like where are you from so i'm like miami and then they're like no where are you from from and i'm like you mean my parents they're from venezuela and then they're like oh my god is that in mexico what what are you talking about? And they're like, do you speak Mexican? Ma You're literally like 50 plus years old. Like, you should know better. Maybe a five-year-old can say that. You are grown. And I've gotten this countless times. Like, I, it's like the most annoying microaggression, honestly. Absurd. Who invented rock and roll? Well, it certainly wasn't this guy. Shake, rattle, and roll. Though he'd have been the first one to tell you that. Nor any of these folks. Every so often you'll see a video being shared across social media platforms that claims to have established exactly who invented the genre. And while many of them accurately point to some of rock's earliest influences, the fact of the matter is that the roots of rock and roll go even deeper than that. I'm Dara Star Tucker, and this is The Breakdown. Before black music became the pervasive musical influence in the US, you basically had two musical traditions, classical music and American folk music. And spend the night with thee. 
Both styles were really just a continuation of European musical traditions. The moment popular music is introduced, you're starting to hear the influence of black American music on mainstream culture. Gospel and blues were the earliest black folk music forms in the U.S., one sacred and one secular. Gospel music mostly consisted of spirituals and call and response songs. While the blues formed from the work songs, field hollers, and chants that began in the Deep South. Well, all I hear about lying in track is fit ahead and quarterback. You never let me but they really didn't stay separate for long. They were fusing and influencing each other from the start. Early ragtime music is the first black genre that gained widespread acceptance. It reached its peak from about 1895 to 1919. It utilized European and classical marching music and added syncopated or ragged rhythms to give the music a bounce that it had never had before. It was really the first iteration of popular music. Scott Joplin and Jelly Roll Morton were two of the early framers of this musical style. From ragtime came the Harlem Stride piano players like James P. Johnson and Fats Waller. Where ragtime was through composed and relied heavily on its classical roots, the stride players improvised. They leaned into the swing feel and they covered more popular music. So-called jazz, which was really a fusing of ragtime and blues, grew out of the black folk music scene in New Orleans in the early 1910s. It was a highly improvisational musical form whose most famous ambassador was Louis Pops Armstrong. His improvisations were the basis for the swing era that soon followed. This was the rousing dance music of the 1930s and 40s. Swing music was dominated by bands like Count Basie, Benny Goodman, Lionel Hampton, Cab Calloway, and Duke Ellington. By the 1920s and 30s, a new driving rhythm called Boogie Woogie was gaining popularity. This form of upbeat blues was thought to have begun as early as the 1870s, since many of the musicians who played this music would have intense jam sessions while train hopping on the Texas Western Railroad. It earned the name Fast Western. A popular theory is that the pulsating bass lines in boogie woogie music were meant to emulate the sound of an oncoming train. Just listen. Producer John Hammond organized a concert at Carnegie Hall in 1938, featuring some of the top Boogie Woogie players. After that, swing bands started to incorporate Boogie Woogie into their dance hits. It's the, boogie woogie feel the, the driving left hand rhythm of the Boogie Woogie and Stride players really set the stage for what would come to be known as jump blues in the 1940s. Jump blues was a fusing of all of the black American music genres that had come before it. The blues. Gospel, swing, and boogie woogie. If you really listen to jump blues, all of the elements of what rock and roll would become were there. 